afternoon. Is that your prayer? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I also have really been enjoying the, the singing, the, the uh, ministry through song and the word of God preached by my friend, Brother Travis. Just been um, so good. And so I'm just with you. Uh, very thankful mm. to the Lord. And uh, we're, we're coming down to, uh, to the end of Camp B. Mm. And we are thinking about not going back home. Uh, some have already started to pack some things in their car and clean up their cabins <laughs> a little bit, probably. And we're thinking about going back. And we're thinking about uh, probably our hearts or minds are turning back to home, to ministry. If you're, uh, well, not just a pastor, but if you're a Christian, you're mm -hmm. thinking about the people in your community and maybe family. And uh, now what's, what's your responsibility as you go back, uh, back home? Um, because, uh, of course, God has called us not to be like just sponges, you know, who just mm -hmm. receiving the word of God, but now we're to be channels mm -hmm. of blessing. That's right. And the things that we learn, uh, we, we want to share, and we want others to, uh, to, to, to receive the same mm -hmm. grace that we have received. Amen? Amen. And, um, and so as I thought about that and prayed about that, um, I've, I've been talking about spiritual formation, but I really felt like I should speak just for a little bit. I'm going to really do my best to be done by three. I have a clock right here. So I'm going to do, try to do this in 30 minutes if I, if I can. But um, this is a really important message to me. And I'm going to kind of speak as a, as a missionary. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a missionary, but not not because uh, you're you're all missionaries in the uh, specialist sense of the word, but but because uh, the way that a missionary has to think uh, is really a way that we should all be thinking mm -hmm. uh, as believers in Christ, seeking to reach this world uh, for the, for the sake of the kingdom of God. So to start our our uh, start us off today. I want us to turn to uh, the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. This has been referenced a couple of times. We've been talking about the character and, and nature of God. And uh, when I spoke, I think the first time I spoke, I spoke from, or maybe the second time, but I spoke uh, from Exodus 34 where Moses has this revelation. It became this very formative revelation of God. And uh, he sees the Lord, the Lord God, uh, God is revealed to him. He hears this voice on Mount Sinai, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in hesed, this unshakable love and, and truth. And so this became this very formative revelation. And we see it in the Psalms and we see it uh, in the prophets. So we, we see this, this revelation coming back over and over again. And we even hear it here in Jonah. And so Jonah receives this calling to go to the Ninevites. <coughs> Uh, if you if you want to uh, kind of if you want to understand a little bit more about the Ninevites and, and and the kind of relationship that that these Assyrian people had with Israel, think about ISIS, because uh, before ISIS was was destroyed, um, uh, their the capital their capital city was Mosul, which is is Nineveh, ancient Nineveh, mm -hmm. and uh, the same kind of you know. The same kind of people, it seems. Very fierce, very, uh, uh, just uh, very uh, uh, destructive and harmful and hateful. And, and, uh, and so uh, Israel, they, they, were, they were just, they were enemies of God's people. And, and God's people, um, unfortunately, had uh, allowed themselves to be embittered and uh, Jonah is, is an example of one who has become embittered. And he sees the Ninevites not as a people to be evangelized, not as a people to be reached, but as a people to be you know, hated. And, uh, and, um, and we see this coming through here in Jonah chapter 4. Um, that it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So 
So he prayed to the Lord and said, and, and what, of course, is making him angry? The revival. Mm -hmm. uh, revival made him angry uh, that, mm -hmm. that God would actually spare the people and he would actually save the, this whole nation, 100,000 plus people. And uh, the king, even the king is humble and, and uh, all his servants and declares a fast and, and God hears their prayer and, and, uh, and saves the people, saves the nation. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. You know, I, I just read this a while back. I'm like, come again? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is why I didn't want to come, because you're, you're gracious and merciful. Wait a minute here. Mm. You know, what, what is Jonah saying here? What he hated, the, the, the animosity, the hatred that he had for the, the Syrian people was so strong. He didn't want God to help them. He didn't want God to save them. That's right. And uh, his prejudices, his bigotry, his racism. Of course, we don't have racism today. But I mean, if, if you know, we may be able to, to think about other people. Um, but his, his, his hatred was so strong that he didn't want God to be good to them. And he said, this is why... Um, that one who relents from doing harm, therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And he, he goes on, you know, this plant. He goes outside the city. He sits under this, that, well, he sits in a, makes a shelter for himself. This plant grows up, provides shade. Then God sends a worm and, and destroys the plant. And then in verse 9, the Lord said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Hmm. He said, it is right. It is right for me to be angry, even to death. <laughs> Jonah, he's such a, such a piece of work here, isn't he? Mm. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? And much livestock. And it just, you know, we don't like how the book of Jonah ends, but it just ends with a question. Mm -hmm. Because it really is, it's a question for us. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Is it right? Is it right for you? You know. And so the question really comes back, uh, back to us. Let's just pray. Father, bless these uh, minutes that we spend together. Anoint. Father, this session is such an important topic here that we're going to be talking about. Please anoint and give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And may your spirit just anoint us to, to this afternoon, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So who are the kind of people who are going to make a lasting difference in, in the world for Christ? And I don't want to belabor this. You guys have been listening to a lot of preaching, but I just want to get right to the point, all right? First, those who embrace their calling. Israel had forgotten her calling to the nations. And the story of Jonah is the story of Israel's neglect of their Genesis 12 calling. It's not just that God would bless you, Abraham, but through you, Mm -hmm. All nations of the earth will be blessed. Amen. We are never reservoirs. We're supposed to be channels. Amen. And it's through you that every that other people will be touched. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what happens, you know, if, if there's no outlet, right? It just becomes a stagnant pool. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that. You can tell churches that are just stagnant. You can tell Christians who have become stagnant, uh, become critical and ugly and all that. I'm not here to talk about all of that. But the ugliness that we see in Jonah, this ugliness that we see in his attitude, is the same kind of ugliness that we can see in ourselves. If we would stop being a channel, mm -hmm. God, use me. Let, use my life. Use me every day. Just let me, let me speak to it. To that person, 
to this person. Let me see people to whom I can Amen. share the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. Don't let me don't let just don't let me be blind mm-hmm. to the people right in front of me mm-hmm. to whom I can share the love of yes. Jesus. So those who embrace their calling, this is our calling. We have been saved by Jesus through the gospel, filled with the Spirit, so that we can go into the world and be his witnesses. Amen? Amen. That's our calling. Secondly, who's going to make a difference in the world, a lasting difference, those who let the character and nature of God form them rather than offend them. We've been talking about the nature of God and his, mm-hmm. his, his, his has said this unshakable love and compassion, and kindness, and mercy. That God revealed perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of God in a body. By the way, Jesus still has a body, mm-hmm. a glorified one. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we are going to be glorified with him. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. But that that God, maybe not the God that you grew up with, because none, none of us grew up with a perfect God image, but, but the God revealed in Scripture, and the God revealed in the person of Jesus, if that God will form us, and we allow this God to form us, then we will truly make a difference in this world. Jonah allowed the character and nature of God to offend him. And because of that, he didn't want God to be good to certain kinds of people. It offended him. And because of that, he became a plant lover more than a people lover. Mm-hmm. Maybe a cat lover, or a dog lover, or a tree hugger. I mean, a tree lover. <laughs> and I'm not political. <laughs> okay, that was, that was a political mistake. But anyway, no, it's just. Any, any, we love anything else. Mm. And, you know, we start collecting stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and we just start getting so attached to, to things. Other than the things that really matter to God. Which mm. basically, at the end of the day, are people. That's right. Amen. It's people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not our carpet, not, not, you know, our nice clean cars, not, you know, you know all the... We've heard lots of preaching about this over the years, and sometimes we're still tempted to like our plants more than people. But may God help us. Allow the character and nature of God to form us rather than offend us. Mm -hmm. Now, Jonah's uh, reference, uh, Jonah referenced the revelation of the glory of God which Moses encountered on Mount Sinai, but rather than being attracted, he was repulsed by, by this. Jonah ran from God because he knew that God's call for him to work among the Ninevites meant that there was a strong possibility that God would be good to them. And and, and Jonah didn't like that. I heard a a story recently. A a lady by the name of Nancy Stauffer told us the story. And to me, it's just the the opposite of the attitude of of Jonah toward sinful people. And I, I just was so... Encouraging to me. She said, I was raised in a very strict, even legalistic environment. And if I told you the group, you, you would know the group. But she said, I, I grew up in this very strict environment. And she said, um, but my father saved my life because of his spirit and his attitude toward sinful people. Hmm. She said, one day I was in a, a little, she said my dad owned a grocery store, and so I was in the store with him one day, and she said these, these uh, men came in, and they were talking about Liz, and how Liz was, you know, working down there at the restaurant, and she was having an affair with this person, and, you know, just all this gossip was going on, and they, they were just speaking so, you know, critically of Liz, and all of that, and, and Nancy said, I was just a little girl, about nine years old, and I was innocent. I didn't know what in the world they were talking about, this affair thing, and so she said, I looked at my daddy and said, Daddy, what, what, what do they mean by, by Liz having an affair? Mm. And she said, my dad said something that just changed my life. She said, he looked down at me, she said, he said, honey, I don't know much about that, but she makes the best cup, cup of coffee I've ever tasted. 
Christ. Mm. She said, that was the spirit of my dad that mm. transformed my life. Mm. Wow. I heard about John Wesley one day. You know, John Wesley was known for, he, he wanted uh, Christians to be uh, very moderate in, in, in their, their lifestyle, and he didn't want fancy jewelry, you know, it's no secret. John Wesley was, he, he wanted uh, he wanted moderation, and he, he wanted us to be frugal, he wanted Methodists to be frugal so they could spend their money mm -hmm. to evangelize the world, and so one day this uh, this pastor, or this person, brought a, uh, a lady up to John Wesley, and she had jewelry on, and she had rings on her finger, and lots of them, I guess. He said she, uh, he said he grabbed that, that hand, and he held it right up there in front of John Wesley. He said, Brother Wesley, he said, what do you think about that hand? He said, John Wesley said, that's a beautiful hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that story because it's just, it's, you know, we can take our stand and if we feel convicted in certain areas and we feel like the Bible speaks about certain areas, let's find it. But it's how 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 we how we hold those mm -hmm. convictions, the yes. attitudes that we have, yes. that's right. the judgmental spirit and the attitude. You know, we can't be used by God if we go into the world with a with a sharp edge. You know, mm -hmm. right, right. and God can't really use us and bless us. And um, but but Jonah was 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 not of, of this attitude and the spirit. Jonah's prejudiced attitude shaped the way he did or did not do ministry. He evangelized, but he didn't. And, and this is what I began to see as I was looking at Jonah's life. He evangelized sort of reluctantly, as you know, and mm -hmm. he was afraid to get swallowed again by another whale, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, was, he was reluctant, but he went ahead and did it, you know. He grudgingly evangelized these people, but because it really wasn't in his heart to do. Mm. He was not being formed by the character of God, but offended by that character. Mm. It really shaped the way he didn't do ministry. Mm. He evangelized, but he did not teach. Mm -hmm. He did not disciple. Rather than stay inside, he stood outside. Mm. And in the book of Nahum, written about a hundred years after this great awakening of the Ninevites, the prophet prophesies Nineveh's destruction. This time, there wouldn't be a revival. And God says, these people are so far gone, there's no more hope left for them. He had shown them mercy a hundred years before, but now. And I, I'm thinking to myself, how is it that in just a hundred years, these people that had experienced revival, now God says, there's no, there's no one seeking me here anymore. And now they're right for destruction. How can it happen? I, th I think, and again, I know this, a little, this is a little bit of probably of a reach for some of us, but I think it has some connection to how Jonah didn't do ministry. Hmm. Maybe he went there, he reluctant prophet, he did, but what would have happened? I mean, we don't know, but what would have happened if he had gone inside the city and set up uh, uh, a place to, to disciple and train, train them how to worship Jehovah? They, they didn't know. These were ignorant people. They were pagans. Mm -hmm. well, what, what if he had moved into the city, invested his life there? This is what missionaries are supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. What if he had become incarnate and just sort of moved in to the neighborhood, mm -hmm. answered their questions about Jehovah, helped them know how to worship him in their context? What would have happened? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know. But we do know that in 100 years, Nineveh was going to be destroyed again. So I want to, that, that's sort of the setup for what I want to, I just want to make three more points to you. And I want to speak to you as a missionary, all right? What, what, will, what will be the fruit, lasting fruit of our ministry in 100 years? What's, what's going to remain? What's going to, what's going to last? And I just want to say that the, the kind of people that are being formed by the character and nature of God. Um, those being formed by the character and nature of God revealed in Jesus are, number one, they're committed to incarnational ministry. 
Those who are being formed rather than offended by the character and nature of God. If we're truly being formed by the character and nature of God, that God revealed perfectly in Jesus, we're going to be committed to incarnational ministry. In the New Testament, uh, we see the incarnational mindset because it's the mindset of Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He was found in likeness of man. He emptied himself, right? The kenosis. He emptied himself and became obedient to, to death, even death of the cross. Jesus, mm-hmm. Jesus didn't stay outside. He went inside. He came to us. He came to where we were. He took on himself flesh and blood. Mm-hmm. He became human for our sake. And if we're going to have the mind of Christ, we're going to be formed by, by this mind, the character and nature of God. We're also going to have that same kind of incarnational mindset. To incarnate is not simply, and in, in, incarnate of course is to become flesh, right? We are flesh, but there's, there's a principle here of, of just meeting people at their point of need, going to where people are. And, and it, to incarnate is not simply to serve people, but to live your life embedded and intertwined with people. We become their friends. We celebrate life's milestones together. We suffer together. We weep together through life's painful moments. We grow in Christ together. We we accept people as they are. We include people. We involve people. All, this, is, this is incarnational life and ministry. This is what we're called to. To, to go to where people are. Right? To, 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 to get down in, in the, just the daily life with, with people. Not to stand aloof. Not, not to, to, to minister from the outside in, but to, to go inside. To live in community with people. Though Jesus was superior, he did not come to us as a superior to an inferior. He came as the very holy but human friend without reputation, sharing our sorrows, bearing our sin, and bearing with our sin, laughing with us, crying with us and over us, sitting at our tables, praying in our gardens, dying on our cross, lifting us up through humility and death. And this is the kind of life that God has called us to. Pete Fleming, one of those five missionaries that was martyred so many years ago uh, in ministry to the Aka Indians, he wrote in his journal, in order to reach these people for Christ, we will have to be like them, able to meet their problems with them and help them develop Christ's likeness in their environment. Not give them an unrealistic goal of Christ-likeness in our controlled environment in their midst. I thought that was just so insightful. Like, how can, how can I help people follow Christ in their environment, in their context? I think that's incarnation, incarnational mindset. An incarnational mindset is the mindset of a servant. An incarnational missionary asks, how can I communicate in a way that you can understand it? How can I meet your needs so that you can listen? How can I demonstrate? How can I demonstrate in a way that is convincing? How can I apply this truth in a way that makes sense in your life, in your climate, your family, your community? How can I make obedience to Jesus and taking up one's cross as simple, uncomplicated, unburdensome as possible? How can I make you feel less intimidated by unfamiliar religious practices? that are so familiar to us. Hmm. Does this make sense? Yeah. Am I off in left field someplace? I, I think this, I think the mindset of a servant is a mindset that says, how can I make it more simple for you to follow Jesus? It's already hard enough, right? Take up your cross and follow me. Right. We don't have to make it harder. That's right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's right. Amen. But sometimes we make it harder for the people to follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and I think uh, the mindset of a servant says, how can I make it less complicated for you? That's right. How can I strip it down to its the essentials and let the Holy Spirit take care of the rest? Yep. Is that okay? Yes. An unfruitful ch- church doesn't ask these kinds of questions. They don't wrestle with it. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not here with all the answers, but I'm saying wrestle with it. Mm. Yeah. We, we need to wrestle with these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, what, what are we doing that 
people who didn't grow up like us can't possibly understand. And how can I simplify things? As I said, as I said to you, when we let our neighbors, Danny and Kim, to Christ, they had no idea of communion, baptism, all these kinds of things. So we started in our home. And we just did a little by little, just teaching that. And, and uh, until things became more familiar. So when, when they went to actually into a church building, things weren't so strange to them. Hmm. When I went to church with Danny for the first time, I knew he wouldn't know anything about wearing a suit and tie and all that kind of thing. So he just took off. It's just a simple thing. I just took off my suit, wore the same kind of shirt I thought Danny might wear just to make it a little easier for him, more comfortable for him to mm -hmm. feel more at home. And I've been to church, what, two or three times in his whole life for a funeral and a wedding. Hmm. It's simple. So, but why is it not that simple for us sometimes? Why, hmm. why is it so hard for us to do that? Well, you know, this person might think I'm not spiritual if I, you know, if I don't do this or that. But who are we serving? Right. Right. Who are we there for? Right. And I think if we're being formed by, by the character and nature of God, this loving God who loves people so much, and you know, then, then we're going to be asking these questions like, how can we even make church? Mm. How, how, can we, how can we do this better to, to make our community feel welcome mm. here and come to the hospital? Because every church must be a hospital, right? right. Mm -hmm. Let the wounded come. Yes. An, un, an unfruitful church, Christian, uh, and, and even workers in the church, we have an agenda. We, have, we, we come with agendas sometimes. May God help us. You know, we have worship wars, and we have conservative and liberal wars, and we have all these kinds of things. Let's just ask, how can we be servants of Jesus in this to, to, these, to these people too? And then those being formed by the, by the nature and character of God revealed in Jesus are committed to training, to, mm -hmm. to discipleship. <clears throat> the story of Jonah and the Ninevites provides us an illustration of why discipleship is so critical. Mm -hmm. the people of Nineveh did, not, did truly repent. Jesus references and affirms this, but they were not discipled. And again, I know this is a little bit of speculation here, but I just wonder. They were not taught. What would have happened had Jonah moved into Nineveh and organized converts into groups and began to teach and train them in the ways of God? But Jonah didn't follow up. He didn't establish any kind of systematic teaching and training, and therefore he saw no, saw, saw no lasting fruit. Right? Mm -hmm. No transformation of the culture. Mm -hmm. There was no change of mind. There was no integration mm -hmm. of the truth of God into the culture of the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. It was a... It was a wonderful day of repentance, and after that, they had no idea what to do hmm. to please God. So there was no alteration, no sanctification of the word, no alteration of attitude, no or behavior, no change of habits and practices. They, 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 they needed, they were sheep without a shepherd. Because right. yeah. the shepherd was out there under a plant. Right. Loving his plants. Right. Right. God help us. Hmm. True. Wow. How can you go about trying to change people's behavior? A change of behavior begins with, with, not with behavior, but with a change of mind. That's right. It begins with a change of mind, and I'll just give you a formula for change. A change of mind produces a change of the affections, and then a change of behavior. Yeah. What we end up doing, and we have done often, is we try to change people's behavior right. without a change of the affections. Right. Which begins with a change of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to, we have to, we have to renew people, right? We have to help people get renewed right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that the affections begin to be transformed and then begin to see the behavior transformation that happens. Right. Good. It's just the way God has ordained things to be. Yeah. And we can't do that without discipleship and training. Yes. The goal of all Christian ministry is discipleship. And discipleship, we ask the question, how can I help people follow Christ? as I follow him? How can I train people to obey his commands as I am obeying and learning to, be, to do his commands? Whatever actions we take as Christian workers and whatever plans we make, there must be a connection to this goal. This is the path of success for all Christian workers. How can I help people follow Amen. Jesus? Amen. And as I said before, and, and I, I'm, I'm not, you know, Bible Methodist, we have our manual and all that, but we don't disciple from a manual because that doesn't create disciples. That create, creates disciples. 
list keepers. Mm -hmm. But what we're supposed to be doing is creating disciples. That's right. right. Followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we take him to the word and we let that the word of God transform the mind and transform the affections. And then we begin to see, oh wow, look. There's transformation of the way they're living their life. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But that's the power of the Word of God. On his deathbed, George Whitfield lamented the neglect of discipleship in his ministry. He said, My brother Wesley acted wisely. The people awakened under his ministry. He joined in class and thus preserved the fruits of his labor. This I neglected, and my people are a rope of sand. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, God uses us. We, you know, some of us are good, better at reaching people, but, but sometimes the fruit then uh, falls off. You know, it's kind of wasted. May God help us to join people in class, in other words, to make disciples yes. for his glory and honor. Mm -hmm. Truth will never be fully integrated into another life or congregation apart from intentional, methodical, relational, systematic, disciplines, some kind of approach to discipleship. Some kind of plan. Mm -hmm. Amen. I enjoy a World War II history, and I think it can teach us a lot. And recently, I, I watched this documentary series on the Battle of Iwo Jima. And there were uh, something like 110,000 American soldiers that were involved in that battle. And for nine months before that battle at Iwo Jima, uh, uh, the, the American forces bombarded that island. Mm -hmm. Every square inch just about of that island was bombarded. And still, when we went, uh, when, we, when we landed there, we went ashore, still there were 24,000 casualties, including 6,000 deaths, mm -hmm. even after nine months of bombardment. And why was that? Because the Japanese had dug tunnels. Mm -hmm. I think something like 15, 20 miles of tunnels underneath Iwo Jima. And so the soldiers had to go... Uh, go to the enemy and, and root, them, root, root them out, you know, uh, just one cave at a time. Mm -hmm. Shoot them out, sad to say, you know, burn them out, shoot them out, but whatever, but it was it was hand to hand, mm -hmm. oftentimes hand to hand kind of combat. It was very it was up close. And I thought when I when I when I heard that and I read that, I thought, you know, this is a lot like discipleship. Mm -hmm. We can we can bomb from the air, we can we can preach, you know, from the pulpit. But real discipleship happens one on one because the enemy and uh, and, and even uh, the lies of the enemy and, and uh, things you know that, that need to be transformed in one's life are, are deeply rooted. They're, they're under the surface, and we need to get into people's lives. Yeah, yeah. Right. You get right up close. Mm. You get right down to where they are and, and work with them one on one. Oftentimes, because the lies and 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 the even sin are often dislodged. Just just. One, one cave at a time, as it were, hmm. until, until they begin to understand uh, yes. the things of God. And so discipleship is just so, so important. The, the, I think the, the, uh, the invisible enemies entrenched within each heart demands close-range mentoring, teaching, and training. Um, and there's a lot that can be said here, but I'm already uh, out of time, but i just make one more point here. Um, let me just give some little practical advice about discipleship. Make disciples your friends. It means fun, food, and fellowship. Sure. Mm -hmm. Be wise. Take breaks sometimes from more organized sort of discipleship groups. Be formal and informal. Don't just think of discipleship as, as a group that you do, but as a way of life. That's right. Working and living with people. Be sincere and vulnerable. Be human. Be yourself. Let them know your struggles too. Be optimistic and patient. Be creative. Be Christ-centered and gospel-saturated in all your counsel, in all your teaching. Then my, my last, the last point I want to make is that those, are, those who are being formed by the nature and character of God are doing the hard work of contextualization. What do I mean? This is a missionary, this is a missionary talk, all right? But we think a lot about contextualization, meaning, okay, so here I have the, the, uh, the, the truth, 
but how can I communicate it and deliver it in a way that they can understand it in their context? So to contextualize is to communicate or deliver the unchanging truth of God's word in the language and in the ways in which people can best understand and receive it. This people group, this culture, this particular place, this generation. Okay, can I, can I say that? Generations change too. We have young people here. I'm so glad for young people. Your generation is different than mine. Mm -hmm. And mine is different than, than, than my father's and mother's. And God's word doesn't change, but generations change. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and there's so many things. The context in which we do ministry changes all the time. Um, to contextualize is to help people groups learn to critique their practices, their rituals. I'm thinking here about missions right now, but you're going to get, your, you'll see the application. Their practices, their rituals, their traditions, their particular, in, in, of their particular culture from a biblical perspective and to establish Christ-honoring, gospel-honoring convictions in their context. Mm -hmm. Good missionaries don't go in and say, hey, here's the rules, guys, and they, well, what's that mean? Well, it doesn't matter what it means. You know, just obey the rules. <laughs> you know, that, that's horrible. Because what happens is we're not making disciples, right? That's, we're not getting, we're not seeing the word of God integrated into the hearts and minds and lives of the people. As soon as the missionaries are gone, guess what? They go right back to their former ways. Because it, right. it, it is, it's our fault, largely. We're, we're, not, we're not helping them critique and evaluate their lives from a biblical perspective. We're, we're not helping them do that. We're, we're doing it for them. Innocence, but we're not helping them do it, and because of that, there's no lasting change. And I think the best way for us to really make disciples in every generation is to help the next generation say, Look, here's the truth, here's your context. We want to help you. Okay, so so let's just use an example like music. How many of you know music changes all the time, right? I talked to some of you this week. I know some some here like Southern Gospel music. Some here like contemporary music. When I was a, a, a kid, we weren't even allowed to listen to the Cathedral Quartet, okay? Because that was worldly music. And, and um, you know, it was just, uh, I don't know, Victory Trio. I don't even know if it was Victory Trio. They probably weren't even allowed, to, uh, you know, my neck of the woods. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm just making a point here, right? That something like music, boy, we can get really sensitive when it comes to music. I'm not here to tell you what kind of music you should be listening to, all right? <laughs> I'm just here to make a point. Music changes. If you ask these uh, young people right here what kind of music they, they enjoy, even who plays Christian. But, but even if you like, I don't even know like country singers anymore, but anyway, <laughs> if, uh, if I'm working with young people, I want to ask them, well, why do you like that music? And have you listened to those lyrics lately? And but let's, let's look at the Word of God and, and just see if we can find anything in God's Word about that kind of, you know, right? Mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I want to disciple them, now if I just want them to obey the rules, I just say, well, look, no uh, Kenny Rogers here. All right? no. Oh, I pulled one out. Thank the Lord, I pulled out a name. <laughs> they don't know who Kenny Rogers is. <laughs> Give me a name. Give me a name. <laughs> Okay, well, whoever that was, he, he had to let him in here. All right. So, music changes. How can I help, you know, I, so I'm riding to school with my children. Now, you, you don't have to do this with your kids, but this is what I do with mine. They like uh, uh, 93 3, they like contemporary music, huh? Contemporary. Yeah, the contemporary music uh, station there in Cincinnati. And a lot of, you know, people sing without, without their mouth fully open, you know, people like that. <laughs> That's why I can't understand them, because they don't have their mouth open when they sing, you know, they're, they're mumbling. And so, but when I did hear lyrics from time to time, I would say, all right, let's talk about, let's, let's talk about, like, I, I'm not sure if that lyric right there is truly, fully, like, biblical. What do you think? You know, 
-hmm. And if they if they didn't think that, I said, okay, well, we're going to go to the scripture, you know, <laughs> and and uh, but but you know if if you have an open heart and open mind towards your children, oftentimes like you, you find re you find receptivity, right? Because you're not saying no, you, you can't ever listen to that. But you're, what you're saying is, but let's let's do it, but let's do it with discernment. Right. Let, let's evaluate that. Right. Let's, so let, let's use discernment here. Right. Does this make sense? Right. Sure. So I want to teach my children discernment. I don't want them just to follow a list of rules because that list of rules is going to keep them very long. Right. Because <clears throat> culture is always changing. And then here's new kinds of music. And here's new lyrics coming along. And so here's new styles. And here's... And so how, how am I going to help my children? Well, I want them to learn to evaluate everything according to the Word of God. This is, this is the only thing that doesn't change, but culture changes. Mm -hmm. Music changes, for instance. And there's lots of things that do change. Mm -hmm. right. Even worship styles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our church at Kenwood worships way different than we're worshiping here this week. And it's not good or bad, it's just different. We worship differently. And, and every every place around the country I travel, and also around the world. They have a very different, you know, style, but they're often singing the same songs, the same truths, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it's, it's, in a, it's, in a, it's in their own cultural context. Mm -hmm. And so, to, to be a, to have a missionary kind of mind, to be formed by the nature of, of, of God, I think, is to help people know how to follow God in their context, whether it's a generational context, whether it's a, a, in a certain part of the country, a certain environment, just help people know how to yes. follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope this isn't like being, I don't mean to be controversial, I just think that if we're going to be faithful to this generation, and that also means that, that sometimes we need to include, if, if, if we are truly the body of Christ, then we need to include some things that young people like mm -hmm. without getting offended. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And young people, you know, sometimes you're being forced to, you know, always worship the way the old people do. Mm. And that's also, that's not fair. And, you know, you also need to learn how to say, I can worship the way old people do and enjoy that too, you know. And we're the body of Christ. And so within the body of Christ, you have different generations worshiping together. Now, sometimes what we're doing is we're just saying, well, we're going to throw all the young people off and do their own thing. And the children go off and do their thing. And the adults do their thing. And then you have traditional worship and you have contemporary worship. You know, and you, I don't think that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. I think we're supposed to be learning how to, how to do this together. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How to worship together. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, it's, we've got to be flexible. And 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 discern discerning in this generation today. Just say it's not just this rule and that rule. This is the way we've always done it before. So we do it this way because we've always done it this way. Well, we're going to die. Yeah. I've got news for you. You will not live long as a church. You will die right. because you can't survive that. Because once once that generation passes, you have nothing left. You haven't learned to change and transition. So we're so afraid of this. We're afraid, well, we're just compromised. We're not compromised. Well, compromise isn't a bad word. Compromise actually is a good word. If it's if, if we're compromising, but not comp compromising a lot of areas, but not the truth of the word of God. Right, right. Right? So anyway, if we're going to let the character and nature of God form us, rather than offend us, I think that we have to just think about these things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of rambling. I, I'm sorry about that, but you know, it's for the end. Is all I got left. <laughs> um, <clears throat> <Don't worry. laughs> but just as just as Jonah, uh, or, or, or just as you know, Jonah didn't go inside, mm. and, be, and because of that, none of us do. Let's learn to be incarnational. I think that people who are just really getting close to people, making making these disciples, these sinners, your friends. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Mm -hmm. They meant it as, as an epithet. He, he took it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. right. So if, if we're going to have the mind of Christ and let the character and nature of God form us, we're going to make friends of sinners. 
We're going to teach and disciple and train them. I'm just going to give a list of rules. And we're going to help this generation contextualize the unchanging truth of the Word of God into a new generation. And we're going to learn to be the body of Christ together. Right. Yeah. Without, criti without being critical, without compromising, mm. but without being critical and just learning how to love each other and grow together in the things of God. Good. Is this okay with the Peabody? Excellent. Okay. Let's go. The boss is okay with it. Yeah. Lord, thank you. You're so good to us. Thank you for your word. Just may may the, 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 the truth and these stammering words, may, may they just help us. May they help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.